You know, the world is a pretty big place when you stop to think about it. Do you ever stop to consider why you live where you do in this world? I mean, why this state or that city or this neighborhood or this street for that matter? Most of us tend to think about where we live in terms of places that meet our needs. You know, good school systems, and good community services, low taxes and affordability, that sort of thing. But have you ever stopped to consider that perhaps God has placed you where you live for a different reason altogether? Perhaps we live where we live, not to have our needs met, but to meet the needs of the people around us. Jeremiah 29, 7 reads, Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. Seek the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Every Christ follower should be a gift to his or her neighborhood. And every church should be a gift to its city. God has placed us and our church in this part of his world for a purpose. To make an impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, we've seen that very thing happening over the years. We've grown from a small Swedish Baptist congregation in downtown Geneva to the expansion out to our South Street campus, to building our West Campus, and in more recent days, the rapid growth of our Shepherd's Heart and Masterpiece Ministries. Recently, we've been asking ourselves the question, what's the most effective way for us to continue to reach, connect, equip, and serve our community? Is it for us to build a larger and larger box at our West Campus? in the hopes that more and more people will drive from farther and farther away to attend? We don't think so. In fact, we believe that God is leading us to become a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives and impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, in many ways, God has already been preparing us for this without us even realizing it. We have grown from one church with one service to two campuses with six services and four different venues. Today, we have the very exciting and challenging opportunity of establishing a third campus by merging with another church in our local area. In fact, that church is right here in the Mill Creek neighborhood, the corner of Main Street and South Mill Creek Drive in Batavia. Now, of course, there's a lot to do and many questions yet to be answered before this could all take place. But we have continued to see God's hand guiding us every step of the way through this process. And so we wanna challenge you to pray. Pray with us, pray for the unity of our church, for clarity around this vision, and that God would give us the courage to follow where he leads. A lot has changed since we filmed that video. <laughs> One of our staff members said, could, that's distracting, could you edit you out? <laughs> but all kidding aside, I wanted to show that to you because that was four and a half years ago. It's, uh, no, it seems longer ago in some ways, but also a blink of an eye. See, four years ago, it's, t it's for those of you that are parents, the time it takes your kids to go through high school. Feels like forever when they're freshmen, feels like a blink when it's graduation day, doesn't it? A lot has happened in a, in a very short period of time. I wanted to show you that. And part of when I watched that, in addition to going, oh, it's fat, Jeff. The, the, but the, <laughs> the other part of it was to look at that and, and, and the language we used then, which we were just beginning, was beginning to crystallize for us what we call the neighborhood church vision, is we're still using. It really was the beginning of something we think God was and is and continues to do in our church. So we wanted to show that video just to say that was before we ever even voted to merge with Mill Creek and, and before any of that ever took place. And praising God for how that's happened, we're going to tell you some of that story in a minute, but it sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. Because all that we're going to talk about, and I know some of you are here and you want to get right to the Q&A part, you want to get right to the, the particular issues you're specifically concerned about. We'll get there. But this is all, it's important that we understand that what we're going to talk about today is part of a, a comprehensive church vision to make the most significant impact we can uh, for God's glory and establishing his kingdom. Uh, you heard that little, the question I asked when, when, uh, during the video, what's the best way for us to make the greatest impact? Is it by building a bigger and bigger box and hope that more and more people drive from farther and farther away? We think no. In fact, we had plans to do that. Some of you remember at our, at our, what's now our Kesslinger site. We had plans to do just that. And God, through the economy, pressed pause on it initially. Remember those days, Ken? And then redirected and realigned our hearts and minds to what he has for us. And I'm so grateful for that. So we want to make plans to proceed, but also hold the things that we are planning with open hands because God sometimes redirects us. And we, you'll hear a bit about that. And so toward that end, I'm going to bring up our, our current executive council chairman, Ken O'Brien. Ken O'Brien, everybody. Yeah, all right. Yes. No applause necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, wow, it is great to see a full house. 
Uh, thank you so very much, all of you, for, for joining us here today. Um, this is uh, very uplifting for us as we've been spending all this time uh, planning to see you here um, to help us uh, get all the feedback that we need to make the right decision. So thank you very much for being here. We do have a lot of things to share with you today, some very exciting new developments, and Jeff's hinted to those. We'll give you the details on those. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to spend just a little bit of time giving you quick updates on some numbers and things like that uh, that Abe will share with us. And then we're going to talk about the fourth campus, and then we'll talk about where we are uh, with Shepherd's Heart. So that'll sort of be the agenda, and then we're going to open up for questions. We'll have plenty of microphones uh, around for you to ask questions. Uh, but before we get started, I do want to say this. I, I know it probably feels like this is happening very, very quickly, or has come upon us really quickly. Um, as uh, Jeff said, we've, we've heard from different people. This morning, Rhonda was teaching over at the Kesslinger campus, and class was over, and, and I didn't get out the door before like 10 people came and started asking me questions about the meeting day, which was great, which is great. But, but I do want you to know that what you're going to hear today is not, you know, been done here in the last couple of weeks. We've actually had dozens of people over many, many months working on these things, looking at things. I know uh, Bruce has been out scouring. I think every day after church, he drives the neighborhoods looking for, you know, uh, opportunities. Um, and so what has come to us today has been the fruition of many months and many different uh, people getting involved um, so we do want you to know that. But at the same time, it's incredibly important for us to hear your voice. Um, and we have been hearing your voices. We've been hearing the various opinions and different thoughts and different encouragements. And that has been very, very good. But uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to get more of that and for you to get to hear from each other. I think one of the things that's uh, we get to hear everybody's opinion, but you don't. You sort of get to hear the opinions of those that maybe you're around, but I, but as, with, a, with a church body as big as ours, it, I think it's important for you to get to hear other people's perspective as well. So we're going to do that today, and we're, we're hoping uh, that uh, this, so everyone will give us the opportunity to hear their voice, uh, because I think it's very, very important. So we're going to open up in prayer, and I'm gonna, I didn't ask him beforehand, but I'm going to do it now. I'm going to ask Mr. Salvati if he'll lead us in prayer. Thank you. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today. I just uh, thank you for the snow, as much as we may not like it, but thank you. We just uh, thank you for what we have before us, the opportunities that we have before us, Lord, and, and the preparations that we've been making. Uh, but we just ask you to cover this day and this discussion with your grace, and just help us give some, uh, some clarity as to what we're trying to do. In your name I pray, amen. Thanks, God. All right, I'm going to turn it over to... Oh. Uh, let me turn it over to Abe to open us up with some a couple of comments. And is this going to be recorded so we can review it? It is, yes. The question was, is this being recorded? And the answer is yes. Thank you for that. Abe? Great. Thank you, Ken, and uh, good afternoon, Chapel Street family. It's great to be with you here on this snowy afternoon. Um, I do want to take a moment. I I'm just going to uh, be brief because, as we've alluded to, we've got some exciting uh, topics uh, to talk about, but I did want to share as we, in the context of those opportunities, that, that one of the reasons that we have these opportunities and that some of these uh, uh, um, updates are even feasible is based on the overall just health and vitality of Chapel Street Church as an organization. And I wanted to share with you some of the recent numbers uh, around some of the key metrics that we look at and that we continue to, to monitor and evaluate that just help give you a sense of where we are as a church family overall. So let's just put up the first slide if we can. This is looking at some of our key financial highlights. We just closed our fifth month of our fiscal year. Uh, we go from a September to August fiscal year, as, as most of you know. Uh, and I'm thrilled just to be able to share that, that God has just continued to pour out his blessing on, on Chapel Street and, and through, I think, the faithful generosity of his body here, I think that, that is a testament to the numbers that we have and, and just the health, as I mentioned, that we are as a, as a congregation. But as you can see, currently through the end of January, actually, our revenues were about $319,000 over budget, which is about a 14% increase over, or about a 14% delta above our budget, so we're operating uh, in, in the plus. I think it's important to recognize that 
that 14% over budget is also in the context of a budget that was increased year over year by just over 12%. So our budget from 2018-19 to 19-20 was a 12% increase, and we're currently operating at about 14% over that number. So I think it's an extraordinary blessing um, and the, uh, testament to the generosity of this congregation. You see, our expenses are running a little bit behind, which is always a good thing, under budget on expenses, about $74,000. And that's driven by a couple things. I think the continued stewardship of our staff. I think we are very intentional about and, and talk consistently about making sure that we are um, treating and, and using the gifts that are given here wisely and, and with uh, an intentionality around our, our strategy and our objectives. Uh, so that's constantly being looked at. And the other part of that is we do have a couple staff openings that have gone on throughout the year. So we're, as we fill those and as we have transition, we've got a little bit of surplus there that we're working with. But good news, we're over budget revenue wise. We're a little bit under budget from an expense standpoint. The result of that, you see we have roughly $830,000 in, in unrestricted cash. And I think sometimes that term is a little bit maybe nebulous. It's not like we have a, a bucket of $830,000 sitting somewhere. It's, uh, this is otherwise known as our operating expenses. So this is our ability to operate. You see we've got about two, just over two months. We tend to month to month operate between two and three months of, of operating expenses available. The restricted funds, which would be in addition to that, which are not here on the slide, are things like our Serve the World you may, uh, um, giving. As you recall, over our Advent season, we raised a significant amount of money for Serve the World. That's in a restricted budget that can use, be used exclusively for those purposes. So our unrestricted funds are really our operating expenses. But net-net, you see there, our total giving for the year is up uh, essentially 23% over this same period of time last fiscal year. So just uh, extraordinarily blessed and, and just grateful for the generosity and the faithfulness of, of this body. One of the other metrics that we look at are not just looking at our, our financial stability, but also the impact that's having on lives. Are we reaching folks? Are we, as Jeff alluded to and as that video alluded to, are we touching more lives? So if we look at this next slide, uh, we did a quick analysis, and these numbers are always a little bit tough to exactly quantify since uh, uh, people coming and going. But we do know that um, overall, if you look back at 2015-16, which is essentially when that video we just saw was, was uh, created, we had an average weekly attendance of about 1,800 folks uh, between our two campuses at the time. Fast forward to essentially where we are now, we're averaging just under 2,300 uh, folks coming in over the weekend, which is about a 450 uh, person difference. So the, the 450 lives that we were not touching, we were not impacting, that we had not been exposed potentially to uh, the, the truth and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ are now here as a result of that. So I think that's an extraordinary blessing as well and just a huge uh, testament to the impact that, that we are all having in, in the community here. So those are a couple of our key numbers. We'll have some time again if there's any specific questions uh, later on. I'm happy to address those regarding our finances. But before I bring Jeff back up, um, I did want to just roll to another video here in a second that gives a little bit more background of kind of our overall neighborhood impact strategy. This is kind of the results of that strategy as we look at these data, both financially and, uh, and based on the impact we've had. But I think it's worth looking back a little bit about how did we get here? How has the strategic vision been put in place? And how does that lead us to the opportunities we have today? So guys, let's go ahead and roll that video. You are here. But have you ever stopped to consider why you live in your neighborhood, on your street or in your house? What if it's not just about meeting your needs, about good school systems, affordability, and proximity to your work? What if instead, it's about the faces and names of your neighbors? What if it's less about you and more about impacting the lives of those around you? God has placed our church right where it is for the very same reason, so that together we can reach our neighbors for Christ. This is our neighborhood as a church, and it's home to more than 600,000 names and faces. And over 50% of them say they have no connection to a church at all. That is every other person you meet. They are the reason we are here. Since the opening of our West Campus, our ability to love and serve the neighbors within our reach has grown immensely. Our Shepherd's Heart Care Center started out as just a closet of extra food and now serves nearly a thousand people every month. Our Masterpiece Ministries reach and serve dozens of families of children with special needs in our community. And our women's ministry is expanding rapidly, reaching more and more women, and they have outgrown our current facilities. We are increasingly becoming a church not for ourselves, but for our neighbors. And as we've grown, we've had to ask ourselves the question, is our greatest impact going to happen by building bigger and bigger facilities? Rather than investing in any one campus to make it significantly larger, we believe we must reproduce ourselves by strategically placing campuses in the communities we are already poised to reach. We are convinced 
that God is leading us toward becoming a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives and impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Neighborhood Impact is an initiative to strategically expand and multiply our gospel impact through establishing neighborhood churches. We have a goal to raise $6.2 million over the next three years. This money will be used to renovate and expand the Mill Creek campus, to renovate and improve our West Campus, and to expand the capacity of Shepherd's Heart at our East Campus. However, Neighborhood Impact means much more than just raising money or adding another facility. It means we must intentionally develop new leaders in all areas of ministry. We've already begun this through our Leadership Institute and are expanding it through the new Pastoral Residency Program. It also means developing new opportunities, keeping our eyes open for communities in need, and cultivating hearts of compassion that can see the opportunities emerging for gospel impact. Ministries like our Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry, Masterpiece Ministry, our Support and Care Ministries have been reaching the unique needs of our neighbors, and we're only just beginning. Most importantly, it means more people transformed by the gospel and committed to loving, serving, and reaching their neighbors for Christ. It means people like you. You see, we cannot do this without you. You are the gospel agent in your home, on your street, in your neighborhood. There are 300,000 people right around us who do not know the hope of the gospel. What could God do if everyone watching this committed to loving and serving their neighbors? This is what Neighborhood Impact is all about. It's about the gospel, the church, the neighborhood, and you. Boy, uh, some of you were, were here when we launched it. That was the uh, anchor video for the campaign called Neighborhood Impact, which, by the way, that three-year period closes uh, in April, uh, just a few months, when we uh, made our pledges and see what God did. So thank you for those who contributed. If you were here and you weren't there then, that's an old video. We don't have a campaign to raise $6.2 million. That's back then. Um, but we're, we're paying that off, and, and we're excited about uh, where God's taken that. I wanted you to see it because that, um, that phrase, a family of neighborhood churches, and a church not for ourselves but for our neighbors. I've been asked the question, why think about expansion? Why, why fourth campus? That, that's why. It was the reason for the third. It's the reason now. It's not to build a bigger kingdom for me or for us or because, but because God's placed us here. And we think it's the most effective way to reach the people who don't know who Jesus is and need to hear about how much he loves them and the purpose he has for their life. And so that's why. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute about the specifics for what may be coming next. But I want you to see those videos to just set the stage for who we are at Chapel Street, what we think God is doing, and where we're headed. It really hasn't changed from those four and a half, five years ago. That beginning of a vision is still the track God has us on, and we're pursuing it uh, with, with lots of prayer and, 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 and generosity and, and grace. And so that's, that's why I wanted to show it to you. Now I want to talk to you uh, about the Shepherd's Heart Project first. Um, let me give you a little history here. First of all, Shepherd's Heart, most of you know this. Um, you're in this meeting, and I can tell by looking around the room, know many of you very well that you know, but not everyone does, that Shepherd's Heart is so much more than a food pantry. So, so much more. It was, and it's in, before we even called it Shepherd's Heart, a closet of extra food up on, the, on this campus down the hall. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a well-rounded and growing and developing ministry that meets the needs of people in lots of ways. The, the biggest face of it is the food pantry, of course, but it's compassion and action and crisis assistance. People that come here, and they're, they're in crisis. They're going to be evicted. They're, they're, they need, they're desperate for help. That's part of your benevolent giving. The benevolent fund goes to, toward that, those needs there. Budgeting and job coaching teams. Many of you are on those teams. In fact, show, show of hands, how many of you have served volunteered either budgeting or job coaching? If you're here, I see those. Thank, thank you for that. A huge ministry to people who come here in need of help. They, and so for the, many of the people who come here and need more systemic help, we'll give anybody groceries that's hungry, but they want to receive financial aid and assistance to get out of the hole that they're in. We don't just write checks. They have to submit themselves to a whole program, uh, which, which Erin Wise over here, wave to everybody, Erin, over here in the corner, uh, that she runs. Would you stand up so that people can see if they don't already know you? This is Erin Wise. She's the director of Shepherd's Heart. Yep. that she runs, and so they do so much more. You, if, if people want more long-term help, they'll come and they'll bring their financials, they'll meet with a team that helps them look at a budget, that prays with them, that shares the gospel with them, not just once, but in an ongoing manner, and they'll enter into a plan and a program to help them get out of the hole that they're in, 
uh, then we will come along and assist them in that way if, if they're willing to do that. And many, many do. Uh, and then the Master's Hands Home Repairs. I think it's Steve Sabati here. Steve, do I have it right that it began with you? Yes, Steve, the, the author and, and perfecter, not of our faith, but of Master's Hands. Right. Um, I, I, Steve, uh, former church chairman, longtime member and servant in many ways, decided to use some of his free time in retirement to serve the people who, because I guess he just likes to fix things. By the way, my wife wants to talk to you. We've got some lights that don't work in our <laughs> No, anyway. Anyway, uh, it's a remarkable ministry with men, and if you're interested in serving that way, we'd love to have you be part of it. Like go and meet the needs of people that d- just need simple projects done and can't afford to get it done. And they pray with them as well. Um, and then, then, of course, the legal clinic, which is the most recent development called Administer Justice in Kane County, to help people who need uh, legal a- advice or help but they can't afford it, don't know where to get it, to bring that to them. And so there's more to say about that. I just want you to know this is so much more than a food pantry. And it has grown, as you know, in the Neighborhood Impact cam- Campaign before, we were trying just to expand the storage, was all we were trying to do, for a relatively small amount of money. And we did that, and we've outgrown it again. Um, when we look at this campus, South Street Campus, we have to ask ourselves, because we are less than one mile away from Kesslinger, our largest campus, nobody plants a campus like, if you're just doing multi-site to reach people, you don't do it a mile away. That's just, I mean, I'm not smart, but that's dumb. Like, you wouldn't do that, right? Because why would you do that? It's too, it's too close. We became multi-site by accident. And just to, in case you weren't here or you don't know the backstory, we had plans initially, you'll remember this, to move the entire church family out there to what we called the West Campus then. We couldn't afford to build a big giant box at that time with a slope floor and fixed seating and theater-style worship center we wanted to. So we thought, we'll move in stages, because we own this campus, it's 47,000 square feet, we own it, we'll move in stages. In that time, that we opened that campus in 2004. Am I pointing the wrong direction? Whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. um, in 2008, the market went in the tank and we had pressed, all, put, pause, pressed pause and all that and rethought things. I'm so grateful that we did because it would have been the wrong decision. It would have been a massive albatross of debt and we would not be a family of neighborhood churches impacting more lives. In fact, the churches that have built giant worship centers find them increasingly hard to fund and to fill. Um, And so we're grateful for that. But then we had to ask the question, well, what about this campus? We we thought about selling it. It would cost us nine and a half million at that time, 2010, as I recall, to reproduce the square footage. We couldn't sell it for barely three. It It made no fiscal sense to do that. We thought, well, this is what God's given us. Let's operate both to his glory and we'll be like one campus with a mile-long hallway. You know, we'll just, we'll figure it out. And we did that. Pastor Brian is the lead pastor. I began to grow my preaching gifts and we figured it out. Um, but this is a unique campus. And we are now asking ourselves again the question, what's the best strategic use of the South Street facility for God's glory? And I believe it's three things. When I say I, we, we believe it's three things. Number one, vibrant traditional worship. We're committed to that. It's not going away. I've said this at every church family meeting. I'll keep saying it for those that need to hear it. It's not going away. We care about it. We're committed to it. We want to do it and do it really well. We want to see it grow. It's unique in this. Most churches are letting go of it or not doing it the way they used to. So that's not changing. Number two, we think it should be the administrative hub or the nerve center for the entire Chapel Street Church operations. Uh, we're, we're growing as an organization. We need a place where most of the operational administrative staff are housed, where they can interface with each other throughout the day, and, we, and that's here, that's down below. And number three, the face, as it were, of our compassion ministry in the, in the, in the, in the community, in the surrounding area, called Shepherd's Heart. Okay, if that's true, if those are the three best uses for the facility. That doesn't mean there aren't other uses, it's weddings, funerals that happen in here, Bible studies and meetings and trainings that go on throughout the week in, in all of our campuses, those are very important. I'm just saying uniquely, what's uniquely used about this campus, those three things, we had to ask ourselves the question, what do we do about Shepherd's Heart? It's out of space in the basement. Okay, can we expand it in the basement? We brought on uh, Aspen, our design build firm, with multiple iterations, conversations with executive council, with staff, different iterations of staff, and with them to try to solve the, the storage access for clients and um, uh, marketplace space in the the lower level. And we felt we just were not able to do that in a way that was effective and uh, and cost effective. Efficient, I should say, and cost effective. Then we thought, well, should we get it off this campus? Should we move it? And we have lots of land at Kesslinger. Should we buy a warehouse? Should we put it in a shopping mall? Should we do something separate off campus? 
We looked at that and really felt like one of the reasons not to do that was because you move this off of any campus and it becomes another food pantry. One of the unique and special things about Shepherd's Heart is that it's connected to the, to the life of our campus. And even though Kesslinger is the largest attended campus, the campus that probably has the most buzzing activity Monday through Friday is this one. And it's good that Shepherd's Heart clients are here interacting with people, some of you who come for different things, and with our staff. So we felt committed to keeping it here. With those two things in mind, can't fix it in the basement, need to keep it here, we have two options. We got to get it upstairs, where do we put it? And we looked at the student center, the, the, the room at the very end of the hallway. And that was the original plan, or not original, but one of the iterations that Aspen gave to, came to us with. Our de staff department heads, the heads of our Chapel Street kids and students and women's and, all of, and care ministries said to us very clearly, given the choice, we prefer to protect the student center because of its multi-use function. It's larger and it's proximity to the kitchen. It's used for more things throughout the week and monthly. And we've done a study of this than, than, than the chapel. And so we'd prefer to keep that room if we had the choice. Everything that currently meets the chapel could meet in the student center, but the reverse is not true, not the same. So then we began to look at, could we meet, can we meet the space needs to grow in the chapel? Now, some of you are wondering, well, what about long term? What about 10 years, 20 years from now? Well, 10 years ago, we didn't see any of this coming. I can't tell you what's going to happen 20 years from now. But we think this answers our growth questions and impact questions for the foreseeable future in the chapel. I want to be clear when I show, we're going to show you some slides here that show this. This is our best thinking to date. It's, we did, have not, we have not, it's important you hear that, contracted with Aspen to go forward because that would cost us contract money. We don't have approval from the congregation to do that yet. We have not set a date to break ground. All of this is, as Ken mentioned earlier, is in discussion mode and in planning mode. But we do want you to know, as Ken said, this isn't coming by the seat of our pants or it hasn't been done in the last couple of weeks. It's our best thinking and, and planning so far. Okay, so we can show the slides here, the next one. It's maybe a little hard to see is from far away, but the, the, the blue, it says chapel in there. The blue square, that's the chapel. That would be converted to be Shepherd's Heart Marketplace and Storage. It would more than triple the space we currently have, both for storage and for marketplace where our guests come to be served. The current lobby, which we have out here, would, would serve double duty as a lobby and waiting room for our guests who come throughout the week in Shepherd's Heart. We don't, if you've been here on Tuesday evening or th that little lobby waiting area is just wall-to-wall -wall people and we don't have space for them downstairs. The uh, student center, we recognize that the, some of the uses of the chapel wouldn't fit in the, in the dark student center because it was built initially painted that way and oriented that way for our high school ministry, which still uses it once a month, but less frequently than it used to. We're work, they're working on plans to do, make that room multi-use. You can pull the curtain and have it brightened up with uh, paint and color and, and natural light and reorient a stage so that what meets in the chapel could meet in there and it would feel very different than it does right now, much brighter and lighter than it does at the moment. Um, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, keep that one up there. Uh, the little blue box next to the sanctuary where I'm standing, uh, where we're sit seated and I'm standing, that little blue box now would be, uh, it's be a, think of the glass room at Kesslinger, the, uh, the little prayer room, glass room, meeting room. It would be a, a, a prayer room on Sunday mornings and a room for meeting with clients of Shepherd's Heart or different meetings throughout the week, kind of where the coffee nook is now. Okay, next slide. And again, these are all, this will be, um, the lower level here of this, of this campus. So, uh, oh, this is the east entrance. Can we go to the next slide after this real quick? To show the parking? Yes, I want to do this one first. Okay. So the big giant gray area out there is the, is the parking right out here. Most of you know if you attend this campus, you either have to get dropped off on days like today or you have to park and walk all the way around, which is not good for many of you, nor is it for our clients who come. Certainly isn't good trying to access those stairs on the east side of the building. Part of the whole project for this campus, remember the three strategic purposes, traditional worship, the nerve center for our whole operation, and Shepherd's Heart, we think we need to address the access and entry uh, to this campus, both here and at the east side of the building, to make it more viable for, for people who are coming. So the first part of that is the parking out here. There's that grassy knoll, which is, <laughs> I don't mean it that way, but that grassy knoll out there with the church sign. Uh, Removing that, redoing the entire turnaround parking, we could gain 30 to 40 more spots right out front, uh, limited mobility and handicapped parking right there with easy access. 
uh, which would be great for our worship, for our clients who come throughout the week, uh, and just for the campus itself. Now go back one slide. Sorry about that. Also, we don't, we, this, this campus does not have an elevator. We have a lift, which is kind of like a, we're afraid it's like a death trap. Nobody wants to get in that thing. It's scary. I don't go in there anymore at all. Uh, and so we just, it's not optimal. You have to use the stairs, which for some people is, is very difficult, which makes the lower level off limits. So part of the plan would be to put a, a very beautiful and new entrance on, I keep pointing east. East is right here. I'm sorry. Right there. The east entrance on this side of the building. Uh, th so these are, these, these are just concepts. These are not architectural drawings. There'll be lots of iterations of this, but the idea would be something like this. Rather than come in and have to go down that, those concrete steps in the lower level, which is not comfortable and not even all that safe for some people, there'd be a, a large atrium entrance full of glass that you could walk in at grade, take a short flight up to this level, a short flight down to the lower level, or get on an elevator, which would take you to either level. So it'd be, it would be a nice, bright, airy entrance to the whole campus on this side that would give you easy access with the short flight of stairs or an elevator ride, half an elevator ride, basically, to up or down. Would make it more inviting and accessible and, and beautiful uh, during the week, uh, and, and certainly for worship as well, people that come in this, that direction. Um, now that's, all of this has price tags to it. We'll talk about some of that later in a, at a subsequent meetings as we get further down the road. But just to give you an idea of what we're thinking about, to address those three things, vibrant traditional worship, the, the operational center of our, whole op, of, of our whole church, you know, administrative core, and the face of our compassion ministry in the community, Shepherd's Heart. That's why we're thinking about these things. Um, what's our next slide here? Do we have it? Oh, yeah. We're, we're going we're gonna, to... I'm... It's the fourth campus stuff is next, right? Okay, so I'm going to press pause on Shepherd's Heart. I know... Many of you are itching to ask questions. We're going to have a bulk of time uh, after I finish this next part uh, to go into that. But, but let me talk to you about what, what I think some of you are, at least many of you are here to hear about. Uh, and that's the, the fourth campus. Let me tell you a story. Do you like stories? Let me tell you a story. We, on my senior pastor goals for 2020, is to identify the site for a fourth campus. Because... We feel it's the best way to make the most significant impact by reproducing ourselves as neighborhood churches. That's why. Doesn't mean we have to launch it. That wouldn't be feasible. Doesn't mean we have to even acquire it. Just means to identify the potential next site. Ken joked about Bruce. I've asked Bruce because he's good at this to network, to look, as, as well as some others. As, and we've looked at a dozen easy properties, some too far away, some too expensive, some too weird, some we didn't trust the people. Like, I mean, I'm serious. I could tell you some stories. It just didn't, it just didn't feel right. And this is not something you force. It's not something that you try to make happen. It just didn't feel like God was in it. And we, we kept looking. Uh, we even looked at, well, I won't go into all that. Right? I won't tell you what we didn't choose. And then a man named Alan Cavender. Is Alan here in this meeting? Probably he's, he's busy cleaning up a room or setting up a room. Alan works part-time on our facility staff. Uh, Alan and his wife have been part of our church for a while. Uh, Alan, uh, Alan had a neighbor of his come to him and say, hey, his neighbor's name is Frank. Frank's the pastor of a church. And said, would your church ever consider a merger with our church? And Alan said, I don't know. And then Alan came to a church family meeting, the last one we had in this room. And he heard us talk about a fourth campus. Alan went back to Frank, his neighbor, and said, hey, remember what you asked me? Maybe. <laughs> so he set up a breakfast. Met with Pastor Frank Russo of Cornerstone Community Baptist Church in North Aurora. Heard his heart. Heard the story of their church. And it felt like I was hearing the story of Faith Baptist Mill Creek again. It felt like God had perhaps, and I get excited, I want to, you know, trust God in the process, but like perhaps God had brought something to us. While we were looking, 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 he brought something to us. And how amazing that it would be through a conversation between neighbors. A family of neighborhood churches, right? So... Tell you a little bit about their story. The Cornerstone Community Baptist Church, you can show the image here on the screen of where it's located. This is, uh, in the bottom there is Butterfield Road, Route 56. You see the Fox River to your left, and the red, uh, red pin is uh, where the church is located. Right across the street is that little blue pin. You probably can't see it very well. That's Schneider Elementary School in the North Aurora School District. Right across, I mean, right across the street. There you see it, a, a close-up of where it's located. Um, go back out to the large the one further away. For a second, please. Thanks. The church is um, is dwindling in, in attendance. Um, 
but faithful, wonderful people. And they recognize that if they do, don't do something significant like this, they're going to lose their opportunity to make gospel impact there. So they're approaching us and asking. Pastor Frank has an amazing heart. A heart for the gospel, a heart for evangelism, and a heart for his church. He's very open-handed. Like, I want to see the gospel preached here and people reached here. And if that means partnering with you, then let's, let's find out how we can do that. Um, right, oh, that, that's Banbury Road to the left of the church there. The church sits on Banbury Road. To the right and uh, to the, I guess it would be east and north, right and top of the, of the map, are, are homes very much like you find around here at Geneva and Mill Creek. Not, a, not a, but, you know, typical suburban upper middle class homes. To the left, to the west, and to the south are homes that are of different uh, demographic, lower income, more ethically diverse, which we think is fantastic opportunity for us to reach people that we're not currently reaching. It sits literally on the border, borderline between two different kinds of neighborhoods. The old Fox Valley Golf Club, which was on Route 25 across the river, is, is up there on the top. It's being redeveloped into single family home, housing development now. There's development going on. Everything about the conversation with the people and the place felt like God was in, is in this. So we came to our executive council, we meaning me and our senior leadership team, and said, told the same story I'm telling you with a little more detail, and asked for their permission to enter into what we call the feasibility phase. Same thing we did with Faith Baptist Mill Creek. It's the phase in which you find out, is this feasible? Could this actually work? And you have to talk through uh, 25 questions, doctrinal questions, philosophy of ministry questions, legal questions, uh, all kinds of questions. Any one, any four or five of which could be deal breakers, but you, have, you don't know which ones those are gonna be until you get into the conversation. To give you some context, with Faith Baptist of Mill Creek, this process took us about three or four months. We had one meeting with Pastor Frank and, and a couple of his staff members, and we got through all 25 questions. <laughs> I'm trying to make up an issue. Well, what about, what about, and he's like, no, he's like, I don't wanna, we're gonna go slow and trust God, but just to give you an idea, it was very clearly, they're ready. Very clearly, they're ready. Um, and in fact, one of, the, one of the guys in their church family, wonderful, dear guy, said to me, I really care about two things. Are you going to preach the gospel here? Or are you going to take care of our guy? <laughs> I was like, yes and yes <laughs> are the answers. So lots to go. We would have to have a church vote, as we did last time, for this even to be possible to have a merger, as would they. But their congregation is around 35, so the church vote can happen a lot faster in that context than it can in our context. Um, but we want you to know that we have been praying about this, we have been seeking opportunities, and we feel like God may have brought one to us through a conversation between neighbors. Uh, you get so excited about that. And so, um, now, uh, uh, one more slide. Do we have one more? Is it, yeah, there, there's the close-up. Schneider Elementary School. Oops, sorry, go back. I'm confusing you. The school, there's a unique story there. If you look to the right of the church, that looks like there's a court there, a concrete slab. Can you see that? That was the original site of the church, which was a pole building at that time. It burned down about 11 years ago. And they rebuilt it where it currently stands. But they left that foundation that, that intact. While they were rebuilding it, they met and worshipped in the, in the school, in the elementary school. They have a great relationship with the school uh, principal. The school plows the church lot, and the church let the lets the faculty park in their lot on, on, on weekdays. Uh, it's, a, it's just a beautiful, it's like what could be more neighborhood church than right across from the school that you have this shared relationship with and, and blessing each other. Just down the street to the north is an is a assisted living facility. Um, and down the street to the west are some lower income housing. I mean, it's poised to make impact. It's small and it might mean some expansion and either before we launch, if we were to do that, or after and we could do that very easily right on that existing slab where the previous church sat. I mean, it just feels like there's so many things that line up. Okay, I'll stop talking about all that. Now I'll show you some external images. Ken, Ken will come up here and take the mic away and I'll start talking. <laughs> um, this is just some exterior looks. It's, it's, it's a small building, seats about 240 if you jam everybody in the sanctuary. Um, but it, it, it would, it, the kids' space is limited. We'd have to do some work on it. But it's a fairly new building and it's, uh, it doesn't need, it, there's no structural issues. And significantly, the, the church has no debt, whereas Mill Creek, uh, we acquired over a half a million dollars of debt from Mill Creek when we merged with them. So there's no debt on, uh, for the church either, even, and they own the building. So it's really a remarkable opportunity based on location, financially, the heart of the people. So, okay, next, next slide, I think. Is that it for those? Good, okay. So uh, I know I talk fast, I, I do that. Is Pete McConkie here? 
Pete said to me one time in the first sermon I ever preached here, young man, I'm sure that was very good, but I don't hear as fast as you talk. <laughs> so when I get excited, I talk fast. I'm working on that. Um, but I hope you hear the heart. I showed you those videos to give you some context for what God was doing and continues to do and why we're working on the things that we're working on. I'm, I know you're going to have questions. And so we're going to uh, do that now. We're going to open up for questions. And as Ken said before, I want to make that clear. You may have a question or a comment to make that, um, that echoes what somebody else affirms their view. And so please don't, every, please, we welcome them. And for some of you who uh, think, well, nobody else has this question, you, you that may not be true. Somebody else may need to hear what you ask. Or a comment, the way you're viewing it. We want to hear that as well. So we've got mics uh, to come around. One we back do over want here. you to raise your hand and wait till somebody comes to you with the mic because we are recording this and we want to also record the questions as well. Okay? So uh, should, we, should we just open it up or should we start with one project or the other first? Yeah, let, let's go ahead and start sort of in the order that you went. Let's start with Shepherd's Heart. Yeah. And then let's do the fourth campus. But if you bleed over accidentally, that's okay. Yeah. And before we do, I, I, should, I should stress one other one point that I might have glossed right over. We were working diligently and praying on the Shepherd's Heart plans when God brought this opportunity for the fourth campus to us. And we're holding them both going, is it both at the same time, Lord? Is it one or the other? I can tell you this much, I think we feel aligned as a, as, a, as a staff and executive council that the fourth campus opportunity is one we should move on and seize if in fact God is in it. It's kind of jumped to the, to the head of the class, as it were. Um, and, but that doesn't mean we wouldn't do both. It just means that that's come to us and we think it's something that God is moving us toward. That and it's probably important for you to hear that also from a financial perspective. With, I'm sure there's a lot of questions about you know, cost, et cetera, and we're working that now. We do have a lot of preliminary numbers, but obviously things have to fit together. But, it, but one of the things we're also aligned on and we've discussed um, pretty extensively is what's the order? And from a financial perspective, the order is fourth campus, then shepherd's heart, then whatever. Now, it could be that all of that comes together at the same time, and that would be wonderful, and, and we would praise God for the generosity there. But that's sort of how things are lined up. I don't have the numbers for you today because we want to make sure we really understand what that means. As Jeff mentioned, the fourth campus, for instance, would probably need some renovation, maybe even on the same scale as uh, Mill Creek. The good news is uh, we already know just from our initial work there that um, we could probably do it for, get pretty much the same sort of facility footprint for about half the cost of what we did at Mill Creek. And we were committed to that uh, from the very initial part of our search. So, so good news there. But we'll share that with you in an upcoming meeting. So I apologize we can't give you more there, but that's sort of the, the way we're thinking about it right now and sort of the order of expenditures. Okay. Okay. Brother Bill, run, Tom, run. That's why we gave the young guy the microphone. Come on. <laughs> it looked like to me, as they looked at the map, it looked like that the lot that the church lays on is in, in about two, 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 two acre, acres, or is that about it? Um, do you remember, anybody remember the exact acres? A little bit more, but yeah, yeah, you're right in that zone. It's, yeah. it's, it's like two and three quarter acres, and they do, now, there is room to expand the parking, if that's yeah. what you're asking. Yeah, it's, uh, is there any land around it, doesn't look like it, that could be purchased for a little bit more land, like a, a double? Uh, no, okay. that's the short answer. It's surrounded by houses. It's right so, smack in the middle of the neighborhood. It kind of looks like the, the size of the church will not... You know, we'll fill it up, I believe, in a couple of years, 250, but that would be probably the end of the growth. Or is there other ideas that it could make it, with parking and everything, uh, bigger than 250? Thanks, Bill, for that question. Um, we believe it's possible, with the expansion that Ken was just mentioning, that, that could be a church of 500 to 600 people pretty easily because you could have two services of 250 plus children. Uh, and, and then that's only two Sunday morning services. If you added a Saturday night service as we have at Mill Creek, it could, it could grow. So we think there's room to be substantially larger than 250. But you're right, it's not going to be a thousand person church. But that's by design. 
We're trying to be a family of neighborhood churches, not big box mega churches all over the place. So, but that's still a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And just but for context, four years ago, there's 450 people now worshiping here as part of the, the, the Mill Creek expansion and backfilling at Kessling and other places that we didn't have before. So we think yeah, that, it, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you'll remember, when we started on this journey, that was actually sort of our, our target was when we got to a number of 500, that would be the time to expand again. So, so that's really where we want to sort of peak out in these neighborhood churches. So this one would be just about the right size for that two, with two services. Steve's got a question? And then you keep your hand up so we can find you. I think you said, Jeff, that they're down to about 35 yeah. people. And my question was, how big were they at one time? And to your understanding, why has it dropped from wherever it was? There's yeah. got to be some external factors here. We, we sh a wise leader would ask the question, what, why hasn't it grown? What happened there? Uh, very similar story to what happened at Faith Baptist Mill Creek. Uh, the churches have kind of windows of opportunity to make decisions for growth and impact. And you miss those windows enough and the window closes. They have aged out as a congregation. They're, they're, there's 35 people and their average age is to reach the families around them is what I'm saying. Pastor Frank said they have back to school events and they get kids to the community to come, but they, nobody sticks because they're just a small, much older congregation. And it's, and it's a, almost, it's a parallel story, isn't it, Bruce, to what we heard when we met with Mill Creek. Very similar. Uh, it really is poised for growth with fresh leadership uh, and, and new vision there. But it, as it stands, that, that's, that's kind of what's happened to them. You ask how large was it at one time? Uh, I think the church is 75 years old. Do I have that right? 75 years old. And I think it was, in, its, in its heyday was in the, in the 80s to 100. So it's never been huge. Um, there's other reasons for that, which I won't get into here. Yep. My question is, uh, why... Did they come to us or to, uh, why are they looking to be acquired or, or what have you? Uh, is it that they just simply don't have the room to expand for the, the, the thing is with a, with a church, with any business, you have to have continued fresh blood. Mm -hmm. And it's, it sounds like the same thing as with Mill Creek, that uh, the fresh blood is going somewhere else, uh, and uh, why would that be? Uh, is it because of the philosophy of the, of the people, of the pastors? Is it that, it, that they don't have physical room for them? Is it they don't have a, uh, um, the leadership to create programs for young people? Uh, there's more to it than simply the fact that the, the population is getting old. And I think that's where uh, we need to, it's just like this facility here, as this one, as the people here age, um, the, the attendance in this particular room is probably gonna get less and less unless we get bleed over from the other campuses. Or unless we, unless we draw people that aren't currently here. And that could also be. Yeah. So uh, lots there, Tom. Um, and I, I do think we did kind of answer some of that. Um, and it would be inappropriate to get into all the reasons I think the church hasn't grown. And Pastor Frank, if he were here, could give you his opinion. And we've talked about that. Some of that I think we leave in those conversations. I'll just say this. You're right. There are, there's a myriad of reasons why churches don't grow. Um, and what they, they understand this to be, much like Mill Creek, is not, is not a merger in the sense of we're, the two becoming one. It really is the death and resurrection. It would be the, the, that entity, Cornerstone Community Baptist Church, ending its life cycle and being re-emerging re, re as part of Chapel Street Church family, just like we did at Faith Baptist Mill Creek. Um, and so it, it, um, and we think we understand uh, how that works and what's, what it, what's, it takes to grow that congregation in that, in that location. Um, so you said there's more reasons than just getting older. You're, that's true, but it's not insignificant that if you're, a, 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 if you're a family with kids still living at home and you come to a church and there's 35 people and the average age is 75, it doesn't feel like it's for you. I, I'm not, this is not a criticism of age. I'm simply saying that's just true, right? It doesn't feel like that's for you. And that is qu exactly the case, what's happening there. So uh, we've got, we got people with microphones. Right, right there. Clark. 
Um, it's sort of, I have three questions actually. The first one kind of segue from, from Tom is uh, when we did Mill Creek, we had 100 plus people yep. kind of ready to go. So <laughs> what do we have that's ready to go, so to speak? Would you like me to address that first before your next question? Yes, please. So that's a great question. Who goes? When do they go? All of that. Just to, to give you, to set the parameters, that's, that's way down the road for us. If we think this is the right thing, and if the church votes to, to merge, and they become part of our, and we acquire that church, they become part of our church family, we then will be in control of the timeline for, to do that appropriately. You mentioned Mill Creek. Pastor Shirley Moore met in the worship cafe on this campus, and we didn't see it then, but a, a nucleus of those people became kind of part of the launch team. But even still, they had a long lead up of incubation period, we called it, to worship together, cast vision together, coalesce as a community before they launched. We would do the same kind of thing with this. We wouldn't just <laughs> stick somebody out there and say, good luck to you. We'd want to we'd launch a, a, a community, a worshiping community from our family of churches in that place. And we'd be doing the same thing we do with Mill Creek, which would be calling out to some of you saying, pray about it. Is it on your heart to go to be part of this launch? And going doesn't mean you like, just want to keep the church small. It means I want to serve the kingdom and make an impact in this neighborhood for the gospel. That's what's happened in Mill Creek, and that's what we would do there. So I'll, that, that's my answer to the first part. Yeah, the, the bill had asked the question I was going to ask about parking, but I was also going to ask about parking at Mill Creek. Yeah. I think there's a need there, right, that needs to be addressed as well? So the, the, the parking at Cornerstone Community Baptist Church is... Uh, Barely adequate for one service at capacity, we would have to grow that, and there is space to do it even though the property is small. The parking mill creek is, has become an issue at high times, Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day, and other times, uh, and when the inclement weather makes the grass difficult to park on. And we do have plans uh, either in uh, um, fundraising efforts or out of the unspent, unrestricted cash you, talk, you saw to expand the parking at Mill Creek. When, well, I can't tell you yet. And my last question is, do they have missionaries at Cornerstone that we would get to adopt? Yes. In, in, that was, that's in the feasibility phase. They do have a couple, and that's uh, one of the things that they... You know, the, the two things they asked that were so encouraging to me. What about our pastor? What about our missionaries? And their missionaries, Bruce will tell you, they're going to be blessed if they become part of... Because they, they, we're going to be able to um, do things that a smaller church isn't able to do for them. Um, in fact, I, going back to the comment, I say this all the time, um, and I borrowed it from Jim Tomberlin when he came to talk to us about multi-siding. We were just praying about Mill Creek. He said, if you ask the average person they want a church of 200, or just 150 for that matter, or 2,000, most will say 200. Feels good. But if you ask them what they want from their church, they start describing the things that a 2,000-person church can do. We think the family neighborhood churches gives us the, the, the opportunity to do both and do them well. Um, the second part of your question about the, the, the missionaries, the, the, the sweet things they said were, what about our missionaries? What about our pastor? And would you promise that you're, not gonna, that you're gonna be a church for at least five years? What they care about is the gospel and making an impact there. They don't wanna see us come in, somebody come in and swoop in and buy the property and sell it for a profit. In fact, they had a church approach them, which was very aggressive. I don't know who it was. Very aggressive and opportunistic and almost predatory and said, no, not interested. They came to us because I think they, they look at us and see, we, this is the church we trust. This is the church that we want to partner with. So, so just a quick teaser on the question you asked about the, the team, the launch team. Right now, within three miles of that facility, we have more than 250... Yes, that was right. Um, uh, <laughs> we have more than 250 families within three miles of that campus that yep. currently attend one of our neighborhood churches. Now, the, so. the campus is only seven miles away from Mill Creek, but it's east of the river, which changes the game right, in terms of travel time. So who's got a microphone and ready to go? Oh, yes. Andrea. Uh, my question relates to some rumors or conversations that I've heard about um, new deliveries to the food pantry requiring entrance over by the chapel area. And I'm wondering if there's any immediate or future plans to take the senior Bible study and the Sunday morning Sunday school class out of the chapel. Um, well, uh, a moment ago when I laid out the Shepherd's Heart plan, perhaps I wasn't clear, I meant to be, that, that, that we are talking about Shepherd's Heart moving into the chapel. 
which would preclude anything else meeting in there because it would become the shepherd's heart space. So is there any immediate plans to do that? No. But that is the plan we're talking about. That is, that, that is what was on the screen what we're, and what we're laying out. Put the senior Bible study then and Sunday school. Yes. Um, so some could potentially meet in the student center. That's why I talked about reorienting part of that room, brightening it up, and, and making that a, a, a better option than it currently is for uh, medium-sized groups. Also, and we wouldn't put the senior adults Bible study there. Also, if we were to do the east entrance and elevator, it gives us better access to lower level rooms that we don't currently have for, for different classes. Not necessarily those two, but other classes as well. Aaron, do you want to, anything else you want to add to the, about the deliveries? Or I don't know what the question was there. You take the mic, so. Yeah, we, it, it's a pretty busy place. So we currently have partnerships with many stores in our community. And so what m you might be referring to is just the weekly activity that we get, which is a lot. And that's why you know, we're having these conversations. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the morning is when all the deliveries come in. And that right now takes place where the dumpsters are in the back of this facility. And we have a door back there. And there's a room with a conveyor belt. And that's where we collect all of our deliveries right now. OK. I know, I know there's lots. we got to keep. So. Oh, good. So, yeah. Hi. So I actually live down the street from that fourth campus hey. that you're looking at. It's truly in a neighborhood. So I think with parking, parking is probably about the same as what you have at Mill Creek. A little smaller. A little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. But then you have this grade school that's literally across the street. Mm -hmm. It's not a busy street. So I think if you can maintain that relationship, we could probably use parking in their bigger lot across mm -hmm. the street. But I also think if you connect with more of the people right around in that neighborhood, you're going to have people that just walk to church. Because mm -hmm. if I were to go to church there, I would just walk. I wouldn't even bother driving because your map isn't quite big enough, but I'm literally the next street down. I'm at the other end of the Cavenders. They live on one Where, end Let's of the find street. Where is your house? <laughs> <laughs> I'm at, uh, yeah, I'm at that corner. So that's where I walk to go vote. Uh, and I love that. We have people doing that at Mill Creek, walking to church. It's a great, great, great image. Which, my yeah. next question then would be, moving there, then are you... Are we going to be changing leadership, like yes. pastor and, yes. and that kind of stuff would all Yes. Pastor change? Frank is 68 years old, and he recognizes that the, eventually he's coming toward the time of retirement. Uh, there, may, there may be a role for him in our staff somewhere. We're working on that. Um, mm -hmm. We would definitely take care of him uh, either way, but there would be a change in leadership. We would, we would plant a campus pastor there from, who's part of our family. Yeah. Right here, microphone? Good. If you have the microphone, go right ahead. That was okay. That was my question. I know, you, I know you're being patient. Keep on the move, Tom. Get over there. We've got some hands in the back over there. Just yell at Tom. If you've got a mic, go right ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Lee. I have a question about the possibility of increasing diversity there. Mm -hmm. Is it possible or is it? It's um, probable <laughs> and likely. In fact, they, had a, they have a Spanish-speaking congregation that's not part of the church, but uses their facility currently. I think it's had some challenges. One of the things that I like about the opportunity for us is it's different enough from the homogenous Geneva you know, area here, but close enough and similar enough that we could do it and do it well. So it's not like we're going to an entirely different culture we don't know, uh, but it is an opportunity to reach people we're not currently reaching. So, yes. Whoever has the mic, they'll tell you it, where to go. Would it be possible to include a, a shepherd's heart with that campus? Because I think a number of people who come yep. to shepherd's heart are from that area. A number of them are? Not exclusively. So, no, no, no. Yeah, that, but, but um, we looked at that, um, and, and, and quite frankly, that's part of the reason I said that this the fourth campus kind of leapt to the front of the line because we want to now evaluate what impact does this have on our other plans. I don't know that uh, there's the space um, facility-wise to, to expand parking and put uh, all that we would need out there, but we're asking the question, should we have two expressions of Shepherd Heart? Is, I mean, we, uh, these are all questions we're asking, so it's a good question to ask. I don't have an answer for you specifically, other than to say we don't have plans to transport Shepherd's Heart all out there now. Yes, go ahead, sorry. John. Yeah, Jeff. Um, what about Shepherd's Heart? How much property do we have here? What I mean by that, instead of here, 
I noticed this parking lot out here. How much property do we have? Could we put a building there? On the, on the property? On our property. Yeah, um, we could do anything. Um, uh, we have not really looked at that because I think we don't want to compromise the parking here. We, this lot is full at the high times of the year, and that's what you'd have to take up a significant number of spots to do that. And frankly, well, part of the issue for us is that, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a deal breaker, but new construction is always more expensive than remodeling uh, existing space. And we have 47,000 square feet, and we thought, we thought the better part of wisdom was to use what we have for that purpose. So yeah, that's a, it's a good question, though, and we have looked at some... We have looked at some options, but not many of them involving new square footage here. Okay, and as far as North Aurora, yeah. uh, you say it's all paid for. If history, uh, if I remember history correctly, that was Southern Baptist back in the 1990s. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I, <laughs> I'm not sure I understood. They are... They are a, a Southern Baptist church, but the, Bat, the, ba, the Southern Baptist convention does not own the property. The church independent owns it. Yeah. Um, I know you've discussed it, so I just need clarification. I know that um, in regards to this campus, you want to maintain um, um, the core administrative uh, yeah. offices, and then also you want to have the compassion ministry. What was your um, reason behind not considering moving the administration offices over to Kesslinger and also the Compassion Ministry, knowing that you have, if, you know, in 10 years, you need to expand Shepherd's Heart. What was your reasoning for eliminating that? Well, we don't have as much unused space at Kesslinger as we do here. I shouldn't say unused, less used. Um, those rooms for our midweek ministries are, are full and we, 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 that would be a, uh, a limiting our ministry over there. So that's one thing. We'd have to build new square footage at Kesslinger, which again is more expensive. We could do it, but it's more expensive. I also think, uh, going back to what I said earlier, this is 47,000 square feet that we own. No debt on this property. What's the best use of it? That's so like for the, for the kingdom purposes. That's, that's the primary reason. Um, but I would say secondary to that or tertiary, however many I've just listed, would be if we remove Shepherd's Heart from this campus and we remove the administrative hub from this campus, I don't think that's good for South Street. I don't think that that's good for the vitality and life and impact of this campus. I don't think it's the best use of the resource, nor is it good for the campus as a whole. So those are all wrapped into our thinking. And again, I, I, we're, we're, I hope this comes across as Ken said. This is our best thinking to date, which we're sharing with you. This is all really good. I don't want to, I don't want to come across as if, well, we thought about that. That's, because you're asking questions that we have thought about, but maybe we need to think about some more. So two, qu two questions. Um, the the uh, 2,200 families or people yeah. per mm -hmm. week that are coming, how's that, how's that distributed between the three current campuses? Uh, Two-thirds or two -thirds are, are at um, Kesslinger, a little more than a third at Mill Creek and a little less than a third here. Okay. And secondly, um, with regard to the fourth... Did uh, I say that right? Yeah, you, said, you got five third. You got... Three quarters. You got... Yeah, you got an extra third there. <laughs> Did you ever see that? Did you ever see that old? Are you, that good old thing you're not doing the math for the finances on this thing. <laughs> Very good thing. Did you ever see the old Chevy, Chevy Chase sketch where he's like, it was my understanding there'd be no math. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Three quarters. So, so about 1,200 people of the, two, of the 2,200 worship at Kesslinger. Okay. And then the 450. At Mill Creek, including Saturday night, and the remainder here. Second question, um, with regard to the, to the new location, what's the map look like in terms of other worship facilities, churches in, in that geographic area? The only uh, great, great question, I'm glad it was asked, we've looked at that. There aren't a lot of, uh, what I would say, evangelical gospel preaching churches in the vicinity, with one exception, Ginger Creek Community Church, just down Butterfield Road across uh, uh, Kirk Farnsworth on the other side. So other than that, there's not a lot of them right in that immediate proximity. So. Uh, yeah, Jeff, uh, Pat and I attended the first two information meetings. Yes. And since then, I've, I've thought about it a little bit. And um, 
I really hate to see us change the front of the church. I think it's mm -hmm. it's attractive mm -hmm. with the th trees and the m the mound, but also the whole lower level below the chapel is a, is a Sunday school room only on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. It has four to ten people, mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. That whole Kids. area. Yeah. Uh, even if they divided it in half, there'd be plenty of room for a Sunday school class and, uh, and Shepherd's Heart. And then you got the area under the, the Family Life Center. Mm -hmm. There's only a couple classes used there. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a ground entrance right over here. You yeah. could avoid all the steps. People could walk straight in. They wouldn't have any steps to worry about. Mm. And the cost would be minimal to do this. Yeah. Uh, the nursery could stay down there. Um, the other classes around there are actually being used for storage right now, some of them for Shepherd's Heart. But there are other rooms not being used at all. Right, that's right. Yeah. So I think since the chapel is used Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every week, and many of them are elderly, uh, I think they feel very comfortable there. That's yeah, been they do. the chapel sure. for, for all of us for over you know, 60 years plus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'd like them to reconsider, because uh, one of the complaints was we get all the stuff stored at that end, we have to haul it to this end. Why not move everything at this end down to mm -hmm. that end? Yeah, getting the storage and, uh, um, and, and display and, and marketplace and, uh, together is, is, is critical, you're right. I, I would probably, um, thank you, Lynn, for that, um, we, and it's worth reconsidering. I, all I can tell you is, we did look extensively at the lower level and felt that it would be um, the way the building's structured, the, the load-bearing walls, the way that the kind of the wonky hallways, we couldn't do all that we needed to do down there. But it's not impossible. Again, with enough money, anything's possible, so. Here, go ahead. <laughs> Jeff, I have two questions. Um, the first one, um, would the pastor for the fourth campus be from our current staff, or would we hire another pastor for that? Great question, uh, uh, Carmen. Thank you for asking that. Um, it would be from our, sta our, our, our staff. So I'm not ready to name that person yet. We're not ready to launch all that yet. Uh, that it will come soon. But we would not go outside. We want someone who knows us, part of us, understands who we are and what we're about. And that's part of our mission, to develop and train those people. Okay. And would that person uh, speak Spanish then too? Uh, a, the be, a bilingual person? That particular person that we're thinking of wouldn't, but we, doesn't he? <laughs> okay. But but um, <laughs> we have talked about we have talked about bringing on somebody either in part time or um, or volunteer to start with who does. So these are all uh, plans down the road. I can just say this: we want someone from in on our staff, and we think we know who that person is. And we would want to address the, the bilingual needs there. And could you also mention the amount of uh, debt that we currently have as far as all three campuses? Yes, currently? I could mention it. Um, I'll let Abe mention it, since I, don't, since I, will, I will probably add it wrong. Thank you. Um, so currently our debt load uh, between our, our Growing to Serve initiative, which some of you may remember from a while back, uh, as well as the what's remaining on neighborhood impact, is right around 2.7, 2.8 million commodities, about set, just under 800,000 on Serve the World that we still uh, have a, a loan on, and we have about 2.2 uh, or so on um, neighborhood impact that the neighborhood impact, as Jeff said, is still in the final phases of, of the campaign. So we have through the end of April. So we're still anticipating more of those gifts to come in. But we anticipate we'll end up somewhere in that 2.7 um, range, uh, give or take, as our, our, our current debt load for, for our, uh, across all of our campuses. Just to put that into context, um, and again, we've got great terms on those loans, which I think is another important thing. Uh, Doug Kite, I don't, think, I don't know if Doug's here, but um, was able to previously kind of um, Re, uh, refinance those loans. So we've got terms on those that are in the uh, low 3.3, 3.4 range uh, for a quite a period of time. So we've got uh, a great financing. And to carry that debt going forward, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, based on our current budget, that's a, about 5 to 
of our overall budget would be used for debt servicing, which is obviously not a significant amount at all. So we, we certainly are looking to pay down our debt, move quickly, and if we, if we have opportunity, we'll certainly con continue to do that and even accelerate that. But we feel like we're being good stewards of and have a very uh, uh, effective and efficient plan to pay that debt off at our current terms. And then I'll, I'll pass the mic back. If we currently continue to pay as we, we are, we would pay all that debt off by 2028. So that would be just to continue on our current timelines. Okay. Um, so, so uh, the person you're thinking that we might put there, can we <laughs> suggest that they take some Spanish lessons? I'm not sure. We just can. kidding. Just Do kidding. you speak Spanish, Chuck? Un poco. We. Then we might have an opportunity. I don't know. Just to. Well, actually, that's not far from the truth. But um, I think that um, as a church and as a congregation over the last few years, our hearts have been warmed about mm -hmm. thinking of those that are the least in our community. Yeah. We're a pretty homogenous community here as a church. And I think we've all been thinking a little bit about, well, where do we need to, where do we need to go, Lord? Mm -hmm. Where's the field? Yeah. And I think all of our hearts have been a little bit convicted by that. That's true. I'm encouraged to hear that there's a community that may not be as diverse or may be more diverse than what we yeah. have and that this may be a place for us. Yeah. I'd just like to hear you, Jeff, talk a little bit about how does that fit into the vision of this particular church. If we would go that direction and there is a community there that could be served and be different than us, what does that mean for us as a church? The, we say there's a community there. You don't mean the church community. You mean the surrounding community? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, when we talk about the neighborhood church vision, it doesn't just mean neighborhoods like ours, like mine. It means neighborhoods in need of the gospel, all neighborhoods. And I, I have long thought and prayed and hoped for that at some, it's, at some point, God would give us an opportunity to uh, contextualize ministry in a, in a neighborhood that's more diverse, socioeconomically and ethnically, than we are here in the, in the Tri-Cities. And we think this may be that. So I, I don't want to give you a false impression. It's not a different country. It's North Aurora. But it is, it is, it is certainly uh, less homogenous than what I'm looking at right now. And that's good. That's a good. It's a good and beautiful thing. And so to your quip earlier about learning Spanish, uh, probably. And I, we, we were talking even now about how we would do that and who we would, could hire and who we could put there. And so that, that's all. Those are all things that I get excited about figuring out with our team and with all of you. If we, it, but just so you understand, we're in the feasibility phase. If we get through that and both church leadership agree this could happen, then both church congregations have to vote to make it happen. And, and so that we're, we're not even there yet. But, yeah. So I want to, I want to be your... Back, well, I want to have the mic. Go ahead. Who has, who has the mic? Back, we have somebody back here. Thank you. Um, hi, Jeff. If this gets too complicated, say, don't deal with it here. But okay. if my understanding... You know what? This is too complicated. Let's not... <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I've been involved in a couple of, of non-denominational church mergers. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it's the same in the, in the Baptist, so I'm just asking. My understanding with nonprofit churches and either acquisitions or however you call them, am I right that there's not really a money exchange? Yes, it's, that's right. Okay. So the cost that you might incur relates to... Um, expansion, remodeling, things of that nature, yes. which maybe could happen over time as you yes. grow the church, not necessarily needed to mo immediately tomorrow. That's true. Okay. That's true. It, there's no money exchange. We're not that, buying the facility. It true. would be the dissolving of one, absorbing into the other. Any costs we incur, we, costs we would incur because we think it's necessary for growth there. Yeah. But that's right. Okay. Good Thanks. Question. Good question. Just a note, we're uh, visitors in this community of believers, um, but we live in a condo community right along the strip where the old golf course was in oh. North Aurora, and uh, we're looking out our back window at the construction of that whole new community of 400 units back yeah. there. So we go toward the fourth campus area when we drive out, mm -hmm. and it's within two and a half miles of us. So 
just a note about the different kinds of community That's people right. that are right. there. It is an amalgamation, it almost is. block by block. <laughs> yeah, that's really well said. It is. Uh, you turn left and you're going in another direction. You turn right, you go to Banbury. There's big communities of um, various income levels across. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. The various main drags through North Aurora. Yeah. It's a very, a very diverse area, but there's people of all income levels very close to that camp. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for that. It is a block-by-block -block amalgamation. I like the way you put that. So I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We told you we'd go until 1.45 today. You have one more question? You can, yes, and let's do it. Here. Let's do it. And then one more over here. I, I just have a very quick, simple question. Would we change the name of that church to Chapel Street? Yes. Yes. Easiest question asked. <laughs> right up here. Or one more. Yep. Uh, my concern is that we seem to, we never get anything paid for. We've been borrowing money in these last three remodeled jobs. <laughs> We still owe money, and now we're going to have to borrow money again to do the shepherd heart thing. Uh, it's a continual uh, use of our money, uh, our tithes to pay interest. Now, I realize you say it's a low percent, but it is a it is a percentage of our budget. Yeah. So let, I'm going to I'm going to steal that question. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, th there's a lot of elements that go into talking about financing. For instance, you said we may have to borrow money to do shepherd's heart. Not sure that's actually going to be the case. We may choose to take some of our line of credit to help us move into the other, fourth campus sooner. Don't know that that's the case. We have a lot of different pieces and parts that we want to work through in terms of financing. But to be fair, part of what we're doing in terms of expanding does require finances. And this, the generosity that we've had here has been tremendous. And we're very grateful that it allows us to do things that maybe others can't do, but how that will manifest itself in terms of actual financing of these different, um, different ac actions over a period of time is something we haven't fully worked out yet. We do have an upcoming church family meeting, and I want to make sure that you know that. And that March, you, 8th, March 8th. March 8th, and we want to invite you to that because that is where we will start to uh, talk about some of those questions. It's a very important question. Absolutely understand that. And I understand there's a lot of people that have that same concern. So I don't want to avoid it other than to say don't have a good enough answer for you. Come on March 8th and we'll talk about that. As far okay? as the shepherd's heart question goes, I'll just add this in. There are uh, some people uh, in our church family who care deeply about that ministry and have uh, already made contributions and commitments uh, toward that expansion when we're ready to do that. So I don't know that that in and of itself we would have to borrow money to do. Um, I, I'm, I think I speak for us to say that we're, we're, we, would, we want to do this in a way that's fiscally responsible, not taking on debt that hampers the church uh, in any way. And I think the congregation is healthy enough, large enough, and, and growing enough that, we could, that that's possible. We wouldn't take on additional debt to do this. So March 8th, please come back. With that, I do want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been extremely helpful. You know, Lynn, I appreciate your comment when you said we should reconsider. You, you don't want to come to these meetings with a free-for-all to say, hey, we have uh, an opportunity to expand Shepherd's Heart or do Fourth Campus. What do you think we should do? Uh, that would be chaos. So we do try and do our very best to come to you with a plan that has been vetted. This one has been vetted by a number of different people and experts and EC and staff, etc. But... It is a plan, and absolutely part of the reason we wanted to hear from you today is to make sure that we are going to the very farthest end we can to make sure we have the right plan for us. So we are not going to reconsider. We are going to continue to no, consider and you. make sure that we're doing the right thing uh, for the campus and for the church. So on that note, again, thank you very, very Let's much. Let me, let me pray. I'm going I'm to turn it over to Jeff in just a minute. He's so anxious. I'm just going to make him wait just for my joy. <laughs> and, um, but very much appreciate your time today. Jeff, could you close us in prayer? I would. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> I want to share with you something. Paige, Paige is here somewhere. Where's Paige? Paige came in my office. Paige, Paige Peltier, stand up, Paige. Paige oversees lots of different things, groups and connections and Leadership Institute and many, many things. She's a wonderful addition to our staff, as are all of our staff members. In fact, toward that end, I'd like all members of our staff to stand to be recognized and say thank you to all of you, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
And, and I'm going to ask, not for the same reason, but these are the people I want you to go to right after this meeting. You can thank and them. And ask them all the questions. Could I have the EC members stand up, please? Executive Council members, please stand up. Thank you. All right, there you go. Okay. Paige came into my office and, and said, she's leading a rooted group, and she said, I want to share something with you I was praying about. And she shared with me a little, little devotional blip from a story out of um, 2 Samuel chapter 5, 4 and 5. Uh, this is the story of David, um, when he's a newly anointed king, fighting the Philistines. And uh, you're probably like, where is this going? Well, hang in there. Uh, you want another sermon? No, just kidding. Uh, David, the Philistines didn't camp in the Valley of Rephaim. And David inquires of the Lord. And God says, go, I'm with you. And he goes and he routes them. Big victory. Did what God said, it worked. The Philistines come back. The enemy always comes back. And camp in the same valley. And this time, I would think, my natural inclination would be like, oh, I know what to do. We worked the last time, we'll do it again. It's not what David does. David inquires the Lord again. And, which is very instructive to me. And then God says, don't go the same way this time. Go around behind them. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, old King James says mulberry trees, then you'll know that I've gone before you. Then bestir yourself in King James or rouse yourself and move. And the word in Hebrew means to cut quickly, act decisively. I love that. Pray, wait, inquire of the Lord. And when he tells you, act decisively. So I just look, thank, want to say thanks publicly to Paige for sharing that with me. I've been mulling over that passage and praying about it. And I think that's a good sort of, um, it's a good framework for us to pray as a church family. Pray and inquire of the Lord. And when he brings it to us, as he may be, then act decisively for he's already gone before you, the text tells us. Let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the way you're moving in our church. We have many questions to answer and many things we don't know, but what we do know is that you're a good God and you're on the move and your spirit is real and you're building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And we're thankful to be part of that. We're not worthy of it. It's not because we're smart or clever or we have the right plans. It's because you're doing things. So give us clarity of mind. Uh, unify our hearts around where you're leading us. Give us the courage to follow where you lead. Thank you that the seeds you planted four or five years ago are still growing and taking root in our hearts to be a family of neighborhood churches, to impact this community uh, for your sake and for your glory. Thank you for all these people that are here and those who will listen to this as it's posted later. Uh, align our hearts with what you want. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again.